It's uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce Asa Hershok. Uh, did I pronounce that correctly, Asa? Asa and Asa. Asa. Same difference. Um, who is um, a very well-respected uh, homeopath. Um, I got to know him because uh, I bought one of his books on musculoskeletal healing with homeopathy. And I know that Lisa, on her training courses, uh, uh, recommends your books as well. Because I think both Lisa and I have found you have a fantastically simple and straightforward way of uh, explaining homeopathy. Mm -hmm. So, Asa, can I start just by asking you to introduce yourself and telling me how you came to homeopathy in the first place? Yeah. Yes, it's been quite a long journey, four decades plus. Um, I became interested in natural health very early on due to the hippie era that I was born into in the early 60s. And I ran into people that were following various kinds of diets and fasting. And the, there was very few books, of course, on these subjects, but there was a few gems around. And so I jumped on that bandwagon, organic eating and all of that stuff. And um, one day, a, a good friend of mine at the time said, hey, do you want to meet a real master? Yeah, I'd like to meet a master. You know, this is the days of marijuana and, you know, hippie, everything. So uh, I showed up at this fellow's office and there was a strange sign saying chiropractor. I could barely pronounce that. Well, what, what is a chiropractor? But I went in there and there was this roly poly elderly man uh, smoking a cigarette, had a cup of coffee in, hand, in his hand, and I noticed he had a drawer full of Snickers bars. So I said, well, this is a very interesting master. Uh, nonetheless, once he lay me down on his table, uh, I found him to be the most extraordinary energy healer that I've met before or since in a completely, uh, you could say, psychic or empathic way, was able to zoom in directly on what was going on in my consciousness and what was going on with my medical problems, et cetera, just through holding my feet and listening. And of course, I, um, I immediately wanted to enlist and become one of those. Uh, but in the course of his uh, treatment, and actually, to finish off that story, after a remarkable visit that brought me to tears, uh, I said, John, what do I have to, to do in order to become what you are? He said, well, did you hear what you just said? What do I have to do in order to be? You got to stop all the doing. <laughs> so that started my whole journey. But I'll, I'll tell you that much later on, when a lot had changed within me due to his ministering, his help, uh, I said, John, how can I ever thank you? He said, you can't pass it on. <laughs> and so that's been uh, definitely a motto or a, mot a lead motif of my life is to try to pass on this incredible uh, legacy that I've been given through him and many other teachers that I've come across because I've spent my whole life traveling through Asia and, and America and wherever uh, spiritual knowledge can be found and healing knowledge can be found. That's been, I've been driven by that. That's been my passion. But uh, one day, of course, um, and I think it was, a, it was a little later when I already had a little, we had a little child and uh, got um, mumps. That's right. A little, little uh, Isa got mumps and went straight over to Dr. John, as he was known, Dr. John LaPlante, Toronto. And uh, so he said, well, we'll just use these little homeopathic pills. I said, well, what's that stuff? And it says on the label, mercury. I said, you're going to give mercury to my child? But by that point, I trusted him and he did. And, uh, you know, mumps, which can last for weeks, uh, it was gone in 24 hours, completely vanished, all the swelling and so on. And so that was my introduction. And uh, I did want to emulate him. And he was a naturopath and chiropractor. So I followed exactly that path. I had I had already was completely, um, you could say anti. I was completely turned off by the medical establishment and the pharmaceutical uh, pharmacological system of of drugging, etc. The toxicity, the the way that they looked at mind body in the mechanistic way, and so on. So uh, I was certainly ready and open for something extraordinary. So I went through chiropractic college, and then we founded the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, along with himself and a few others, which is now in its whatever forty something year, and going strong, very strong in Toronto, <clears throat> and graduating many, many thousands of naturopathic physicians over there. So that, that was my beginning and that's my, my continuance. <laughs> wow, that sounds amazing. So you're based in Toronto now, are you? 
Uh, no, I left Toronto for sunny California ah. um, ago, <clears throat> probably uh, 25 years ago, something like that, maybe 30. I haven't got my, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a biology fellow, but I'm not much on mathematics and statistics and so on. So that's, you know, I, I can forget dates quite easily. But I've been here a long time. Yes. Yeah. They, they, uh, after we got the college going, they offered me the deanship and so on. But again, I, I, I've got the travel bug and I, I wanted to wander and travel and went to India and all over the darn place. So here we are. And, and, uh, you know, that I probably wouldn't have fit that well into a, a rigid academic, um, uh, institutionalized situation, even though it was naturopathy pushing paper and so on. I'm, I'm more of an explorer, more of a, a, a wild card. So, oh, that sounds that, amazing. That is the, uh, that is the, and 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 also in my homeopathy, I never take anything for granted, but I investigate many different avenues and uh, come up with solutions that are uh, congruent with my internal uh, knowingness. I've come to trust that. Uh, that particularly in terms of my evolution as a as a healer, I did go into practice in Toronto. I was practicing for a, a while. Uh, and then I um, had an opportunity to go into uh, the traditional Buddhist three-year, three-month retreat. And so I did do that, and that really consolidated my um, my capacity, but also my willingness, my confidence in trusting the internal, uh, the internal knowingness, the internal wisdom, wisdom mind, as they tend to call it. So that has really informed my whole practice. And I, I, you know, I do practice homeopathy, obviously, in an unorthodox way. Uh, it's not just about tabulating symptoms, and we can talk about that, um, different ways of finding the remedy. But I certainly um, use the skills that I've developed to tune into people. And so I feel I can pretty much solve all kinds of impossible riddles uh, through directly speaking with the body, directly listening to the body. Everything that's going on in our in our biological being and in our psychological and spiritual being is being broadcast. <laughs> we can't help but broadcasting that. So if you learn to listen to those messages, then uh, you can garner tremendous kinds of information, absurd kinds of information. I had to uh, maybe give you a little example. There's a, you call it, call it a patient that I just had. It wasn't a patient because I never met the person. They live in Japan, but um, we, we had some other business dealings going on. And I found out this person uh, a friend of theirs had a serious cancer situation in the hospital, et cetera. I didn't even know what kind of cancer, but I said, well, you know, just give me their picture, send me their picture and their name, and maybe I can listen in. And so I took a look at the picture and just the picture, I don't even really need the name, the picture is usually enough. And uh, I got some very strange answers, just listening. The, the kind of knowingness we're talking about is the same as other sense uh, impression sense fields like you when you hear something you see something you're not analyzing it it just naturally arises that okay I, there's a blue vase and there's a green plant there etc so in the same way this uh abilities the skills that i developed are the same kind of knowingness it's a direct knowingness there's no there's no mechanism uh apparent to oneself but the information comes in that way and it's, it can be sensory can be in one's own body there's different ways that that works which again we could discuss but anyway i said you know all of your all of your problems your cancer actually comes from your feet somehow you're not getting energy from your feet at all there's a complete blockage of energy and that energy has not been coming up into your abdominal area and there's been no uh coordination you could say the chaotic situation which is what cancer is where there's a lack of vitality and there's a lack of communication between tissues all the things that can go on when there's a lack of chi or energy or prana and so on and so forth and i also recommended what she should do again based on her own messages that dr laplante said to me i'm in the and this is back in the days before email he says i'm in the business of opening other people's mail and reading it to them <laughs> because they can't get their own message. So basically, the message even of what to do generally comes from the patient, the way I work these days. So I told her what she should do and kind of unorthodox things like, you know, uh, relating to the earth, grounding, of course, uh, practice of grounding, walk around barefoot, singing songs to the earth. Uh, a lot of these ancient rituals, which we might think are, somebody might think is superstitious, <laughs> 
probably none of your listeners, but you know, these are very real ways of connecting to the unknowable energies of, of the natural world that surrounds us, whether they're biological, psychological, spiritual, uh, bioenergetic, they they exist. And so um, I gave her that information and I heard back a couple weeks later, I said, you know, all of my problems actually started. I've had tremendous foot problems all my life. And this cancer all started when this doctor put me in these specific orthopedic shoes. And that's when this cancer all arose. So uh, she had had these problems all her life and it was her feet that started this whole issue. And so she was quite aware of it. And uh, I don't know how she's doing now, but it's that kind of messaging that I like to hear. That's that's the most direct way of finding a homeopathic remedy, though I don't rely just on that uh, avenue, but collect all the normal case history. I'm, I'm very proficient in my understanding of physiology and pathophysiology and pathology and psychology, et cetera, what, whatever I can pull together uh, as a framework to understanding the information that I that I receive. And I also use a bioenergetic testing device, which I use way back in the old days, Dr. LaPlante used um, uh, radionic equipment, which I found absolutely staggering, stunning. It's the amazing science of radionics that of course is, was outlawed and people were jailed and all kinds of horrible things happened in, in the sordid history of radionics. But- I didn't uh, know that. Oh yes, oh yeah. The, um, what was the name, the, the most famous radionic a practitioner in America or developer. Oh, I'm sorry, I forget his name. Yeah, he he died in jail. <laughs> but yes, they, they, they banned. These were banned, and they, they're still banned. I'm sure. Um, but you know, you can you can get away with it by calling it something else. So I use a, a type of energetic testing device, which is very very accurate, very helpful, and um, I know it's accurate because of using it for 15, 20 years, and also following my own health. It's just remarkable what it can pinpoint and uh, things that you don't expect and things that you do expect. In fact, that's when I first came, I was looking for a new device after coming from Canada and radionics seemed like it was a little too out there for a lot of people, though I'm, I, in some ways, I'm sorry that I stopped using radionics, but um, there's different reasons for that. It does leave you open to a lot of energetic fields, which can be problematic, you know, when you're when you're broadcasting this kind of energy field, then you're getting a lot of different feedback from a lot of different sources. So it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, can you maybe the, just explain a little bit more what you mean by radionics? Oh, radionics uh, were developed as, uh, I think it was an offshoot of the, the development of radio itself and tube radio and so on and wavelengths and the, the, under, the early understanding of um electromagnetic waves and fields and transmissions, radio transmissions and so on. So radionic devices, you use an actual numerical sequences that relate to different wavelengths uh, of, um, you actually dial, you're actually using diodes and dials, which then create different wavelength frequencies that do, re that research show, their re that kind of energetic research show relate to organs, tissues, processes, you name it, and colors, whatever you want, you can find an energetic, obviously it has an energetic uh, fingerprint, blueprint, uh, frequency, not just a frequency, but there's a much more complex um, field, right? Unique field. Uh, you, really, it's a, a geometric field, a complex geometric field. Uh, that's unique, a unique finger, fingerprint or signature of that substance or process. So radionics is a way to not only receive that information, to see if the person resonates with that information, if there's a, if what you're tuning in in your radionic equipment is found, you know, you're like listening in to see, like like dialing in for a radio signal. Say, oh yeah, I got the station there. It's coming in loud and clear. So we're dialing in for stomach. Uh, yeah, oh, stomach illness. Yeah, that's showing up. So, um, and the, the kind of uh, Gallert instruments that I use are big panel. I think there's 45 different dials and quite extraordinary stuff. So a lot of treatments with Dr. LaPlante who's just tune in the dials and then leave the room. <laughs> and uh, then tremendous things happen inside your, your being. 
so uh, these these instruments were developed. Different types of instruments were de developed. Something called a pathoclast, and you know the, these some of these antiques are still around. And they're well, they're, they're, actually, they're I use radionics. Radio I use radionics mm -hmm. to create my homeopathic remedies. Oh yes, the the uh, what's yeah, his name? Sulis. Sulis. No. What's the name of the original fellow who was doing that? Um, see, I'm terrible with names. Oh, I don't. Um, I don't know. The original fellow in England who developed mm -hmm. a system of cards, putting cards in a box and turning a dial. And I visited him way back in the old days, and uh, quite a fascinating guy. He had. Uh, what do you call it, the slide carts, you know, like a circulating slides automatically changing every minute or so. And he had the patient's hair samples in those slots. And then he would treat them all. He had some universal cards so he could treat everybody with this. So we would have this one card that as people went around, they got treatment, uh, their hair sample, which of course resonate according to physics. There's a quantum entanglement and that hair sample will always be connected to that individual. And so he's giving them treatments around the clock, this thing was just rotating and around the slides. And that, then he died of a heart attack, <laughs> um, which to me was secondary to the, the problem with radionics, of that kind of radionics. When you are broadcasting these kind of energies, it's not unlike certain kinds of meditation. You know, you definitely can, I've done a lot of Buddhist meditation for, for many decades. Uh, you can tune into all kinds of realms and realities and dimensions but <laughs> be careful <laughs> and it's the same as in uh well i can give one example reiki uh what i do is not reiki a lot of people do reiki and you just have to be certain that the energies that you're that you know where the energies that you're pulling down come from what is the source of those energies i've certainly seen that go wrong you can't make a blanket statement saying it's all bad, it's all good, but it can go wrong. So it's just like anything else. Is it, Energy medicine has its own set of contraindications and, and dangers, the same as biological medicine or even nutritional medicine. You can overdose on selenium and certain B vitamins and so on. You can take too much B6, et cetera, cause neuritis. Um, so in, in bioenergy, you have to be a little careful, a little cautious and don't call up what you can't put down. So when you're radiating out to the cosmos like that, uh, you don't know what's gonna come back and show up and it's just overwhelming in many ways to your system. Uh, wow, thank you. That's, a, yeah. that's the best explanation I've ever heard for that. <laughs> yeah, well, what I do and the, the books that I'm writing now, which are, I've been a, um, what I mean, I've been an, either a torture genius or a starving artist for a lot of years because I've been focusing on these books for 10, 15 years. And this year, I'll really start putting out the the books that are at the core of my experience or my, you know, what I've what I've been researching and searching for over the years and found and discovered, luckily. But uh, it's been very difficult to put it together. But that's coming. It's coming soon. So but yes, what? What I like to do is make, like, as you said in my books, what, uh, what I like to do, and I seem to have a gift for, is to make very complex subjects simple. <laughs> because they really are simple at their essence. So that's what I go for, is the essential. So yeah, even, even to speak about, you can even speak about, if you wish, speak in terms of negative forces or demonic, if you want to call them demons. But of course, they, just the same as on this planet, there's some really dark stuff very dark stuff, very evil stuff goes on here. The same with the rest of the universe. It's not some beautiful, blissed out cosmic field of play. There's a lot of bad stuff everywhere. And there's a lot of wonderful cosmic stuff. But just because it's cosmic doesn't mean it's all good. So you have to be careful. And that's why in, in Buddhism or any, any well-structured tradition, that is built, there's protection built in. Uh, so if I'm meditating on Tara, Tara itself is a protective sphere. You can't go too wrong if you follow the tradition and uh, meditate with Tara mantra visualization as prescribed. That has a built-in power of positivity. Otherwise, if you're just making stuff up or just going for it, then it'd be dangerous. So, you know, I, I use protective, I use protective measures. <laughs> So you talk about meditating on Tara. Can you explain a bit more about that for our listeners? Oh, in uh, boy, that's a big field, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Vajrayana Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, 
as well as uh, many forms of Shaivite uh, Hinduism, has a methodology where you, instead of meditating on an external deity or praying to an external god, you see yourself in your ultimate enlightened form. Of course, if you're in that enlightened form, you don't really have a self, but you see yourself as already there. Instead of, you take what they say is you take the uh, fruition, the end result, as your path. So instead of waiting till I am Tara, now I will take on in my mind the form, the mantric sound in my heart, and the consciousness of Tara as, as much as possible. You you suspend disbelief and you believe that, yes, this is this is my re the real nature of my Buddha mind, of the Buddha mind. And it's not mine because it doesn't belong to my personality, which is a whole other problem we can get into when you confuse this and try to make, try to bring it down to you rather than you go up to it. That's a problem. But anyway, so, that, so that's these kinds of meditations. So there is a form of green Tara, this beautiful goddess from medieval India. You know, it's an, an ancient uh, look to it. Uh, but nonetheless, because so many uh, fully realized beings have, uh, you could say, created this or brought this down to us and have uh, achieved development, liberation through it, etc. It's got a lot of protection within it. It's a very powerful, very positive force. So that alone has its, that is used, in fact, to fend off all kinds of negativity. So when you do those meditation, you're not in danger of some other something sneaking in. Gotcha. Whereas okay. if, you just, if you just went, oh, something, come help me, which I've seen people do. Something? What's something you're talking about? There's a lot of somethings, and some of them are very seductive, and they can make big promises, too. It's called making a deal with the devil. This is this is just the reality of the bioenergetic world. There's, there's nothing... There's nothing woo-woo about this. This is just, this is ancient knowledge. This is what people have known for many thousands of years. The modern mind, of course, is generally closed for many people. So maybe this doesn't make sense to them, but it's just, it's just very obvious. And it's not, not delusional. It's not make-believe. It's just how the, you know, it's what's there. I imagine because you've traveled a lot, you're seeing the same um, themes come up where, wherever you're going. So, you know, the yeah. energy in homeopathy, the energy in acupuncture, the energy in the, the yeah. yogic side of the world, you see this theme keep popping up and therefore you start to realize, well, this must be the reality. Yes. Yeah, there's a very long lineage of, uh, LaPlante used to call them gray beards, but women don't have beards, so we'll call them gray hairs. Uh, there's a long lineage, whatever field you go into, there's a long lineage of people who have built and strived and sacrificed for us, and we have received that inheritance. And uh, I'm always very appreciative of those great masters that came before. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, al I'm always studying the teachings of the ages and from every part, even though I'm a Buddhist, that fortunately I'm extremely, I wouldn't call it eclectic because I'm not trying to make a soup out of it. I'm trying to find the golden threads that run through the ancient Greco-Roman or um, Babylonian, it, wherever I can find that wisdom, I'm, I'm looking for it. And especially because I've honed in on certain core uh, concepts that guide me, such as the five elements that I had mentioned to you. Uh, so, you so tell me a bit more about the five elements. Mm, wow, we're going there already. Wow, we may as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is one of the oldest, longest-lasting concepts in in human history. It's very ancient. Maybe it certainly goes back to the oldest recorded writings in the East and the West, uh, or in the East, or East and West. I mean the the two different civilizations of China and India, let's say, or those uh, larger localities. But this was in the original Vedic literature going back 5,000 or more years. You can find traces of it in the Mesopotamian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Chaldean era. Uh, but this is the, as opposed to the Chinese five elements, which are actually, it's a, that's been a misnomer from day one, quite irritating, because it's the five phases 
as many modern writers are starting to change their nomenclature because it's misleading. It's not an element. It's a phase or a uh, sequence uh, series, the five series, because they trans they transform into one another. The elements are fixed. Um, sometimes you could say fixed concepts, fixed uh, meanings, and fix, fixed uh, characteristics uh, that come through the Indo-European, Indian, uh, Greco-European system. So that's fire, air, water, earth, and space, uh, with which are not obviously not synonymous with those physical substances of uh, liquid or gas, etc. But they're the basic principles that run uh, the outer universe, our biological bodies, our psychological structure, and uh, our spiritual possibility. So it exists on all those levels which makes it a wonderful, um, I, I call it an organizing system. If nothing else, you can call it an organizing system. If you still don't believe that this is a, a reality with, with or the structure of our actual universe or internal universe, then use it as an organizing system because it's uh, invaluable and uh, infallible too. You can always apply. You can apply that five rule, five a point rule to everything. If you know those characteristics, those different five characteristics, then you see they apply in so many different ways. And so for me, the knowledge that I've gained about human beings from homeopathy and about disease actually from homeopathy and uh, information from Buddhism and other sources about our spiritual makeup uh, form a wonderful union, especially Tibetan Buddhism is squarely based on five elements. You know, the, the prayer flags that people see uh, here and there when the five different colors. And when you go to Bhutan or Nepal, you can find uh, there's some hills that have literally millions of these flags that are put there. Though um, I would dare say that most people don't understand what the deeper meaning of those, but of course they don't have to. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so yeah, the five elements are a very, very powerful guidance system. And that's one of the first things I do when I'm working on people is, okay, which is the core element that is disturbed in that person. Because once I know that, that, that gives you a tremendous amount of information. If, if they're having an earth element problem, then and, and then I know where when I know where it is in their body as well, where it is in their body and what the element is. So then I go, okay, earth element. So there's some problem with structure, stability, security, grounding, earthing, uh, confidence. Uh, I like to call it having your domain, being in your domain doesn't mean having power over other people, being a king or queen of other people, but things are where they should be. They're organized, structured. When you look around, we see that structure kind of rules supreme in our world. Structure is the first thing that we are aware of. And many people, their concepts don't go much beyond structure. I mean, all of our insecurity about uh, our livelihood, you know, the roof over our head and eating. And so that's all an earth element problem. So it's a big problem. It's the basic problem if we looked at maslow's triangle yeah. which i don't like which i don't like but uh, nonetheless that that's the earth element issues so it's a it's a wonderful way to hone in very quickly um on on what's what's cooking with people so i mean you you mentioned there about um sort of the eastern way of doing things chinese medicine has those five elements and it talks about the body <laughs> system uh, is it something more than than we see in that Chinese med medical approach, or um, so? Because I'm, I'm hearing, medicine. I'm hearing a little bit of Chinese medicine. I'm hearing a little bit of chakras, and um, yeah. and you know, I'm I'm kind of hearing a, a lot of things that I can sort of relate to. And yeah. and how is it that you're bringing these things together? Uh, I'm not an expert in Chinese medicine, and back in naturopathic college, I made that determination. Either I can master homeopathy or master Chinese medicine. They're, they're, for me, I felt they were both too vast to really, and I think that was correct, though I still you know, really have a tremendous respect for, for Chinese medicine. But the especially the psychology of homeopathy attracted me tremendously. I've always my core drive in in life has been what makes people tick, what goes wrong, how can you fix it? That that's it. So homeopathy really provided an opportunity to 
understand people in a far deeper way and help them in a more, much more direct way than psychological counseling could ever, ever do, as we know. You can solve problems that have been psychologically picked at for 20 or 30 years, and you can solve it with a, a remedy. Boom. So so you and I know that, but our listeners yeah. maybe don't know so much. Can you explain a bit more about how valuable... Oh, should we, should we, I'll, finish that. The first, I'll just finish a bit of the first question sure. first. Sure, okay. In terms of the... the um, what was the question about the East? Oh, yeah. You see, you mentioned chakras. I won't go too much into chakras. It's actually chakras is the proper Sanskrit pronunciation. Chakra is, I, I'm in the habit too of saying chakra, like a Californian, but chakra. Um, unfortunately, like so much in our modern era that becomes popularized, it also becomes mangled. And the current incredibly, uh, I've got a book that I'm writing because I did a, I did a very extensive seminar. Well, for me, it was extensive work. The seminar is only you know, 20 minutes, but uh, or the talk was 20 minutes. But I did a lot of research on on the chakras, uh, true, false, and secret. That was the name of my talk. And so, uh, and there's a very, very good book that folks can read meanwhile called The Rainbow Body, though it's a funny title uh, because it's about the rainbow sh chakras uh, by the fellow by the name of Leland. I forget his first name, L-E-L-A-N-D. And he goes into the history of the current chakra system. Though there's other people like oh, Wallace and Tompkins, other Sanskrit researchers that also have a lot to say. But the current system as it is, is, uh, is a fabrication, unfortunately. It, there is no, there ain't no rainbow system. Traditionally, there's no rainbow system. And you can read Leland's book and find out who added that and how all the different pieces came together. Over a 106 year period, people added this and that and so on. And uh, for me, the uh, I'm a traditionalist, even though I'm a, you know, a wild, wild man. Um, but I do like to start with the tradition and go from there. So the chakra system as it exists now is a really an aberration of the traditional information. It's really mashes it up and adds all kinds of absurdities. And especially the whole psychology of the chakra system as it exists today is based on Jung, is 100% based on Jung. Well, I don't think the chakras originally knew Jung. <laughs> and that isn't part of the original chakra system. The, the elements are, the five elements are. Uh, so. Anyway, there, there's a lot of issues there. That's a, as I say, that's a book. That's a book in itself. That book will be coming out with all my other books. But yeah, that's that's a nice shocking book because uh, not only the true and the false, but then the secret because there's some aspects of chakras that even the Tibetans are not aware of uh, what the background is, why why they they have two different chakra systems and they don't nobody talks about and they don't really know about how they get switched around, etc. Then your second question was. <laughs> So then we started to get on to homeopathy and psychology and how powerful homeopathy could be oh, yeah. Um, yeah. in psychology. Yeah. Well, to, to uh, maybe backtrack to say, how does homeopathy work? Yeah. Because that isn't explained very well anywhere that I've ever seen. Like cures like is that may describe a mechanism, but it doesn't describe how that is because homeopaths, have made an extraordinary, earth-shattering, mind-blowing discovery that changes the whole of the whole of our uh, perception of reality. Period. My my recording isn't working. Why? Funny thing. It's okay. You're recording. Um, I'll send you. This. Yeah, homeopath. Homeopaths made a, a discovery that turns everything on its head of what we understood about our physical universe. Because how is it that a, a shell or a stone on the ground or a flower or a tree or a dog or a cat, maybe we can understand them, a bird, a lizard, a flea, how can they have an entire psychological profile attached to them? How does that make any sense? Is that anthrop anthropomorphic? In other words, it's like Disney, they make, little animals talk and so on, act like they're humans, but they're not really. No, those psychological profiles do live within those substances. What does that mean? And if it, if it is true, aren't we looking at, shouldn't we be looking at the universe in a completely different way? Shouldn't we be looking at trees and plants outside our, it dramatically changes our view. 
And homeopaths somehow seem to have missed that. They're too busy, I guess, treating people. But it's a very odd thing. The, the only ones who really glommed onto that were the Steinerians, Rudolf Steiner and his followers. You know, the amazing group of books by the Steiner followers like Hauschka and um, Twentyman. And there's a, there's a few other authors. They A lot of them published in the British Homeopathic Journal way back when. And there's some very nice books by, um, oh my God, not Hauschka who wrote those books. Anyway, uh, I'll get the reference later for you. But they were the, the only ones who, and that's what turned me on to this idea. Plus uh, a very amazing book on ancient Egypt by a fellow by the name of Isha Schwaller de Lubavitch, uh, called Herback. I don't know if you've heard of Herback 1 and 2. And that's a wonderful book about uh, ancient Egypt and the spiritual path of ancient Egypt, written as a novel. But within it, you discover that uh, the way that things were made in the arts and the way that things were approached was because they were not symbolic, but they were living uh, uh, containers of a meaning. So reading that book helped me understand even further that everything we see outside of us is a meaning made flesh, you could say, a meaning made into uh, a living substance. So within every tree, within every plant, as I say, animal, there's a meaning. Matter of fact, it is the meaning. <laughs> it is that meaning turned into a form. And all homeopathy is doing, all it's doing, is it extracting that meaning, that informational system from the substance. We don't need to treat, we don't need to give, grind up a dog and give people dog. We can give them the energy of a dog. And of course, we don't do that. We might use their milk or in some animals, their blood or a feather of a bird. So we're not actually killing animals anyway, but we're extracting the information from that uh, substance. And then we are applying the information to a person. Why? Why would we do that? And again, that's the other great secret of homeopathy that the Steinerians know, but uh, most homeopaths don't think about for some reason. But in you could say that within our body, we have, uh, we're a microcosm. So we have all those meanings inherent in our being somehow. And they manifest as organs, processes, uh, mental attributes, characteristics, narratives, etc., storylines. And nature has the same stories within it as a macrocosm. The exact same meanings are in nature, except there they manifest as a full species. And that's why nature is so diverse and so odd. It's like a dog, a bird, a cat, a dolphin. They're just remarkably different because they each express a very different meaning. And homeopathy somehow, incidentally, accidentally, found a way to extract that meaning. Now, in nature, it's fine for a dog to be just that meaning, right? You, a dog doesn't wake up in the morning and go, oh, should I be a cat today or should I be a rose or maybe a petunia? No, it is only what it is. A dog is very doggy and a rose is very rosy. So there, it's quite normal for those substances in nature to be uh, very limited, very narrow. They express one meaning or archetype. But for us, we're not supposed to be stuck into one archetype. Imagine if you're stuck into the archetype of a spider, of a tarantula, then it's pathological. When we become limited like that, when our entire microcosm takes on only one meaning, that's pathological. It's like if the whole of nature had one meaning, then there'd be no nature, <laughs> it'd be very pathological. So if you find the archetype in nature that matches the archetype we're stuck in, and you use that mirroring system and you show the, the body mind, look, here's the archetype you're stuck in. What do you think about that? That's all homeopathy is. <laughs> I always say to patients, it's like if you're, you have your shirt isn't tucked in today, uh, I, I can go, oh, your shirt's not tucked in. And you go, okay. And I don't say, here's how you tuck a shirt in. You put your hand here. and you... All I have to do is show you. You inherently know how to tuck a shirt in. Not inherently. I don't think you're born that way. But you do know. You know that's the analogy. But you do know. So same way, when you show the body mind that, look, you're 
You're acting just like a spider. That's where you're stuck. Here's your capa- here's your capability, but you've narrowed it down to here. And that's pathological. And it comes with certain physical pathologies, mental pathologies, spiritual pathologies. All you have to do is show uh, homeopathy is nothing but a mirror, magic mirror. It does not do any. Y- yes, there's a bioenergetic frequency and all that, but it is really not telling your body how to how to work. Yeah, herbs do that. Yeah, sure. There's there's nutrition, nutrients and so on. They do have an informational component and they can correct imbalances. But homeopathy is doing nothing but telling you what's wrong. It's the same as a very, you know, a very good psychologist, psychotherapist or psychic or maybe an astrologer. They'll say, you look, here's what's going on. You go, oh, my God. They don't tell you how to fix it usually, <laughs> you know, but oh, my God, I didn't realize I was doing that. I was acting that way. I didn't know, realize I was being very... Uh, very harsh in my speech or whatever it is. So we're relying, that's why vis medicatris nature, we're relying on the body's inherent wisdom and knowledge, biological wisdom, psycho-spiritual wisdom. We, we do know how to correct ourselves. And of course, this is one of the grand differences between the uh, uh, blank slate school of psychology. You know, you're just born a blank slate and then everything gets written onto you and then it's imprinted. That's it. We're saying there already is an inherent uh, wonderfulness of our human nature. Uh, Trungpa, the great uh, Tibetan uh, master who uh, was one of the pioneers in the early 70s of bringing Tibetan Buddhism to America and he, you know, dressed in business suits and so on. He went to Oxford, et cetera. But anyway, he said, he, he called it basic goodness. And that's another way of saying there's an inherent structure to a the goodness of a human being, the uh, morality and ethics and everything else. That's, our, that's already, you could say hardwired. I hate that <laughs> term because we're not a computer, but it is, it is there, it's inherent. To us, so that's what homeopathy is relying. It's relying on our inherent inherent wisdom and uh, the inherent meanings within us, our totality, to correct us by feeding us the right information, and that's why homeopathy fails sometimes. And as uh, as well known, the best prognosis in homeopathy is when the symptoms are very very clear cut very specific and you know what time of day it bothers you and you know what you like and you don't like etc cetera, etc cetera. the worst prognosis where everything is vague i'm not quite sure where it hurts or when it hurts i don't know i just feel bad because that means the body is confused the body mind mind is confused it's not mounting a very uh, integrated intelligent well organized defense system so that means even when you give the homeopathic remedy that wisdom may not be so reachable if you can't get through, for example, there's a lot of medical drugs which may block the, the intelligence of the body from reading that information. And that's why traditionally they say, oh, take the homeopathic remedy away from food, away from coffee, away from this and that, so it doesn't interfere with the information. It's not because there's, well, of course, we know there are specific antidotes, but anything really disturbing, even a very bad uh, physical environment or home environment that can disrupt the remedy. You're under tremendous amount of stress that can disrupt you from getting the information from, so the remedy can't really work. And of course, once it's in you, it's, you may have, if you have a very low vitality, again, you may not be able to use the information. And that, this is another great danger of homeopathy. I know I'm skipping around here, but that's my mind. Um, the uh, knight in the white charger syndrome, uh, I would say of uh, the uh, of homeopaths when they first start out and say, "Oh yeah, I'm going to blast through this case," and I just, um, and then you give a remedy which just floors the person or makes them worse because you don't want to hand them a solution that is more than they can handle. They don't have the biological because homeopathy is not giving you more biological resources, not giving you more nutrition, it's not giving you more energy. Usually, some remedies, yeah, carbo veg, lycopodium. Arsenicum is a small handful of remedies that give you more energy. And I use those a lot because people are very depleted. But mostly they're just giving you a, a menu of here's what you should do. Lachesis, here's what you should do. Well, you know, the, the old saying, give Lachesis 200 and then leave town. And that's, that's old. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that one, but it's an old saying. Uh, because 
there can be tremendous upheaval when that information is used. And also that information is sometimes hard to use if you're not ready for it. It's not necessarily the first remedy you'll always use or some you know, very strong remedies where people have to ease into it. Um, that, that reminds me of uh, through my NES testing, that, that little device that I use, I had a fellow come in that had um, had a hepatitis B and uh, he had a very high teeter and he had done every medical therapy and every alternative therapy you've ever heard of. And still that teeter did not move. Nothing. He tried to interfere on everything. So we tested him on the instrumentation and the liver didn't show up at all. And hepatitis didn't, didn't show up at all. Interesting. No wonder. You're not getting better from all those things. Your body doesn't even know what's happening. This, this testing system, and even the way I approach, it's a priority, a priority testing system. So we want to know, what is your body trying to do right now? Not what is the clever doctor, homeopath, whatever. What do we want to do? What can you do? What are you trying to do? So that's why I use that device. It helps me to know if it's something that I can't figure out. But actually, even the old Vega testing, they would always test if it's compatible and if it's uh, available, right? So those, those are two things. Is it available? Is your body available for this treatment? And is it compatible with you? And one or the other or both can be off. So in any case, I treated him for one year, for 12 treatments, once a month for 12. I don't know why he kept coming, but uh, only on that 12th visit, the liver showed up off the chart reading and the hepatitis showed up off the chart. I said, okay, now you can go back and do any of those treatments you tried, whether it's conventional or alternative, et cetera. All of them will work because you are ready for it. And so we had to get through many, many different layers uh, that were obstructing possibility of cure. Maybe there's a neurological, immunological, psychological, spiritual, traumatic, we don't know. But as you go through, you treat what's available and that's same. And you're, you're kind of doing that by getting people's symptoms. You're getting what's available. In one of my books, I think is my, my white cover book, Homeopathic Remedies, which I don't have a copy here. I, I have a picture of uh, sheets of kind of a, my own drawing, sheets of paper, one on top of the other. And these pieces of paper have holes in them. And so these are the different layers of our illness. You can't get to that bottom layer of the onion immediately. But you may be able to see it through one of these holes might even line up with other holes. You can see right down to the bottom. <laughs> and some of you may see down one level, or some you may see down two levels. Many of them you won't see at all because they're hidden by the top layer. So it is, a, again, a potential mistake in homeopathy or any form of healing that you're going to, you oh, they had a childhood trauma. Let's treat that. Wait a minute. That's, that's not up for them. That's not available to them. When you give this remedy and that remedy, then it comes up. Oh my God, I had a dream about it or I'm experiencing it. Now you can treat it. So when, when things come up like that, you go, hallelujah. Now for the first time that is available. And that window might be a very narrow one. It might close again. And then you can't treat it again till who knows when it comes around. And we, we see that in our own life, how things come up naturally. This this regret comes up, this that come, this emotion come, you wake up in the morning and you're thinking about some past in some future, in, or you're not. And so when that's there, say, oh, it's available. If I have time or I want to, I can work on that because it's up for me. That's all, it's available. Somehow that popped to the surface. And if it's important, I'll work on it. If it's not, then fine. It's just stuff churning. Stuff is always churning. So that wow. answers one question somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, that's great. I mean, it's a very different um, way of thinking about it. I mean, I, before we got on the call, I mean, you and I started talking about the fact that homeopathy is so, um, you know, when when you when you first find it, you think, oh my God, this is going to solve everybody's problems. Once I tell yeah. people about it, everyone's going to want some. And yet yeah. that's not the reality. <laughs> um, yeah. And I do think perhaps it's because so many people are, um, they're not thinking very deeply about um, things. They want a quick fix. And yeah. our, you know, our, our conventional med medical system gives them a quick fix. And they don't actually have to ponder and think about what's going on in their lives. They don't have to do any internal work. Whereas I think homeopathy, there is a little bit of work that comes alongside it. 
Um, well, this, this, you know, this is a, a you could say philosophical, psycho, psycho spiritual, philosophical problem of our whole culture is that it has it takes a symptomatic approach, whether that's uh, you're talking about politics, economy, uh, environment, health. It's symptomatic. Let's just put a bandaid on it. It went away, so you're fine. And uh, I can understand the. We all understand the appeal of that. When you're in pain, you want to get out of pain. But then it becomes more than just getting rid of an acute pain. It becomes the laziness and the inability to go deeper. But then we are people are generally programmed that that's all that's needed. So in that case, it's just ignorance, not stupidity. I'm not saying people are stupid, but ignorance that you don't know. You don't understand that there's a deeper cause. And sometimes when you let people know that, you know, I understand you're taking those pills for your heart, but there's a deeper cause. Maybe it's nutritional, maybe it's psychological. And so you could go on that avenue and get off the purely symptomatic approach. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a war uh, for war for the soul of people, uh, whether they want to um, understand that the, the, as you said, more difficulty, when you take more responsibility, then it's going to be more difficult. It's going to be more demanding and um, time consuming, energy consuming, and so on. So people may not want to make that commitment. So that's where uh, both society is at fault and the individual may be at fault for just not having the um, fortitude to go ahead and, and make a change, you know, it's because it's, it's a lot. Do you, have you seen since the pandemic, have you seen any shift in people's thinking and about health yourself? Well, I, I think the, the information that's coming out continually is definitely turning people around. It may turn out definitely to be in, in, uh, to the advantage of alternative or real medicine, because many people realize that the the what what we have known for a very long time the the financial interests of the pharmaceutical industry outweigh any other uh benefits that they may uh intend or portray so many people are becoming disenfranchised and uh dis certainly disillusioned with the pharmaceutical approach and its limitation the suppression of ivermectin i mean it's this is this is just criminal activity, but that this is part of the, for me, there's nothing new because for many of us, we've seen this. I've been treating the effects of medical malfeasance for, for all these 40 years. I've been treating vaccine injuries for that long, et cetera. So there's, it's nothing new to us. And the extent of corruption or the extent of um, uh, greed as a motivation is nothing new. And it's just naivety to think otherwise. But, well, um, it's interesting. I was reading a book by Jill Turland about um, the magic of the megadoses. Mm. And um, in her introduction, she had some interesting stats. I think she said, if memory serves you right, something like 36% of all hospital intakes in America are for iatrogenic disease. That's disease caused by the doctor in the first place. Mm. I found that pretty astounding. Um, there's a number of different studies where they've actually, because no one is collecting that information, though there's all mortality uh, statistics, but actually collecting all the information state by state and by individual counties and so on, consistently uh, medical practice is the first, second, or third, and often the first leading cause of disease, of, of death, period. And that has been true for many, many years. But generally, those statistics aren't collected, except by individuals who will go and uh, put them all together. So yeah, that's that's what we're living with. It's a, it's a very strange thing. So so COVID, of course, was uh, the ultimate expression of a bizarre, this bizarre, uh, what would I call it? A d bizarre mind control, brainwashing, uh, delusional system that exists within our society. And I, I was very disappointed myself in, in how many people did not uh, or conform to these concepts or of how much faith there has been in the cult of uh, modern medicine. So, yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to see over time how much difference it makes. People even think, oh, well, it was... Modern medicine is great. Its concepts are great. 
Um, but COVID was a you know just a little blip on the screen. There was some, and that's what they're saying themselves. Of course, that's their way of worming out of it. So oh, yeah, we we admit that there was a problem. We didn't understand there was myocarditis this and that. So you know we're sorry. It won't happen again, kind of thing. But um, uh, yeah. hopefully there'll be a, a bigger sea change, and people will will perceive that there's other there's other possible ways of approaching wellness and health and cure and treatment. Well, I think, um, I, I don't know whether it was the pandemic or whether it's just the new generation coming through. I'm seeing a, the younger generations are um, being a little more wide awake to choice, to freedom around their health care, to actually taking responsibility for their own health care, which I find, you know, for me, I was brought up in an era where it was all about work hard, earn money, you know, that, that capitalist kind of view whereas now there's a gentler side coming through people are a bit more caring maybe it's because we've got more information we've got the internet now um but i'm seeing people taking more responsibility for their own health and i'm seeing people a lot more inquisitive than for example my generation so um i have got there's there's hope for us yet i think as as homeopaths out there yeah and i think one thing that has happened also is there's more um, people like Russell Brand and, well, even Bill Maher, d different people who are who have a tremendous public following who are speaking out uh, in a often in a very balanced way and getting people to just look more carefully to to have a, a clear perception of what's going on around them. And that larger organizations, governments, uh, different institutions and uh, corporations don't necessarily have their best interests at heart, and so you have to have self responsibility. You know, yeah. So yeah. see, but you know, COVID was tremendously painful and difficult for all of us. But uh, on a psychological level, the uh, the polarity and the political the political uh, divisiveness and conflict that was brought to the fore that was already going on. Matter of fact, <laughs> in a very early blog. I said that energetically, I still believe that bioenergetically, COVID was a uh, rose up bioenergetically as a result of the hatred that was fomented over the last four years, the kind of vicious, vociferous language that people were using and the hatred engendered against one another that awakened this COVID force. So I still do believe that. And but you know, I won't necessarily say that to everybody. That's yeah. my Buddhist. Yeah. And so that is unfortunate. And that that goes to the uh, the deeper motivation I have in getting my books uh, out this year, because uh, I guess I have what they call a Christ complex, because I do believe the information that I received. I, I didn't invent it, but I certainly received it took a lot of uh, it took a lot of effort on my part and a lot of sacrifice. But the information I received uh, can really change this world. Obviously, psych modern psychology has miserably failed at changing the tone of the human race. Whatever uh, successes it has had individually, that's great. But as a whole, even its theories are you know, very deeply flawed. It's part of the medical establishment. And their concepts are quite erroneous, but co also quite widespread, quite, quite uh, broadly uh, respected and accepted. So... The books that I'm writing will uh, turn that all around, I believe, if, if people, wh whoever reads these books will be changed, I believe. Because there's certain, there certain ideas or truths about human nature, which just uh, hearing them once blow your mind, uh, establish you in a different level of understanding about yourself and about others. So uh, hopefully that will happen. Because so, human psychology is actually pretty darn simple. It's not, it ain't so complicated. It's really straightforward. Uh, there's one, you know, I collect books. I collect PDFs of books, you know, because I, matter of fact, at one point when I started doing my traveling, at that point, ebooks didn't quite exist. And I had a library of over 2,000 books. It took me two years. I scanned them all into PDFs. I got a scanner and I just cut them all up, <laughs> scanned all those books. So I, okay, wherever I go, I got my 2,000 books. Well, since then, I've got another, whatever, 5,000. But, um, uh, I've got one book, uh, I think it's called The Encyclopedia of, Medical, of Psychological Systems, something like that. It's got about 5,000 entries and 500 different psychological systems are listed there. Many of them in quite 
contradistinction or even conflict with each other. So this is the uh, the famous Tower of Babel, right? And you can, uh, if you're a psychologist, you might know this, otherwise you might not, that just as in uh, physics, they've been looking for the unified theory of the universe. In psychology, there's still, holy grail is still the unified theory of psychology. There is no 500 different system. There is no even close consensus on what human nature is or what normal is. You will not, you can look on Wikipedia under normal. <laughs> there's no, what everybody does. Well, no, that's called average. That's not normal. And that's why uh, I, I like to say, and you know, I can't wait to put this in print so I can be attacked. Uh, easily 99% of anything you read in a psychology textbook, let alone pop psychology, is wrong. Why? Because all the studies and research they do, they assume are on normal, healthy people. No, they're on average people. And the average peoples are crazy. <laughs> the average people are not in their right mind. So they're doing all this research and coming up with conclusions as, as if, well, this is how people are. No, that's not how people are. That's how the dysfunctional people are. You need a set of normal people to work on, and probably you need a normal researcher to work on them. But since they don't know what normal is from themselves or others, how can they find them? So it's, it's a big problem. Oh, you sound fascinating. That sounds fascinating. You, you talk about books in the plural. So tell me more. How many books are you actually writing at the moment? I don't have my... I could pop over there and get... You can probably splice this up on your blog, right? But... Um, I many years ago, more than 20, 25 years ago, I put out my my book empire. And, you know, I'm, I'm very graphic. I, I love art, the arts. And so I design all my own book covers and so on, including the one that the musculoskeletal book. It was a very early cover. <laughs> but um, I do better than that now. But uh, so there's probably 40, 50 books there. But the main ones now that I'm focusing on that have to do with what I call elemental psychology. Um, elemental psychology has three main pillars. One is called the two U's, U, true and false. Because again, this, this main problem within mainstream psychology, religion, philosophy, all of them have the same problem. There are, there are two of us that we're dealing with all the time. Of course, there's multiple selves, multiple subpersonalities, but there's two main ones, and um, there they can be helpers, or they can be deeply in conflict with each other. And you are supposed to live within one, and the other is just the servant or the tool of the other. So one is your essence. This comes from direct from Gurdjieff, G.I. Gurdjieff, from the greatest mystics of all time. Um, our essence is our biological self, our constitutional self, and our, you could say, our psychic, karmic, spiritual self, how we were born, our totality of what, who we are, our makeup, unblemished or, or I'd say, unaffected by the outer world, though that's not really true. We have karma. We've, we've been inside a biological process already. But anyway, here we are. And this relates very, very much to homeopathy. Because homeopaths also don't, the first thing they should be thinking about is, is this essence that I'm treating? Or is this the other one, which is persona? Persona is everything that has been poured to you from society, culture, history, parents, school, etc. And it is, it has an identity of its own, obviously. All of our language is part of that persona. Otherwise, I'd be saying blah, 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 blah. We each have our own language, baby, baby language. We learn the language. We learn uh, styles of being, of expressing, of hand movements, probably be millions of components, facial expressions, etc., which is another reason why masking is a horror. Masking of children for three years is, I mean, this is fiendish, you know, because what a child learns from, uh, or masking of adults that a child is, is uh, an infant is learning from, because this is where we learn so much about the, the common ling lingua franca, the common languages we share. So anyway, that persona should be, uh, if I am dwelling, if I am centered in my essence, my being, my core, 
whatever that means, I mean, that's a big talk, but if I'm centered in my core, then my persona is a wonderful congruent expression of that. We call that true persona. It's just, it's, um, it's got the articulation, it's got the style, it's got the verb, it's got everything that matches who I am. It dresses like I am, it talks like it, it's able to express me well. So it's a, it's a great little tool, it's like a great pet, it's like a little doggy, and <laughs> that's, that's my tool, that's my, uh, that's my screwdriver and my hammer, that's my persona. But it is all mechanisms, right? If I'm not present, if I'm not here, a persona could just take on. You, you see two people talk, talking and say, oh, hey, how are you doing, blah, blah, blah. They're not even there. It's just some little tape is playing, right? Most of the time, tape is playing. Uh, when that persona is developed, it does not, is not in any way congruent with your makeup. It is based on what you saw on TV, what your parents told you, what society said, what kind of medicine you should use, blah, blah, blah. There is no personal decision was ever made. Now you have a store-bought persona or off-the-shelf persona that you might think that you chose, but you know you saw, uh, saw somebody on TV when you were a kid and you want to act like them, etc. We pick up these things. W when I have seen uh, video of myself, I'm always shocked at how many of those characteristics are the way my father talked. I don't like that, <laughs> but nonetheless, they're there. So there's whether you like it or not, there's 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 pieces. But when that those pieces take over, or those those pieces are the running the show, instead of your essence running the show, persona is running the show, the false creation is running the show, now you have a problem. And that happens to such a degree and to such an extent in our society that there, I would say the majority of people that you meet, that you know, some may be close friends live fully within their persona. They don't even know what their essence is. They certainly cannot speak from their essence. Go on any, go watch any TED talk. You go, do they sound real? Are they, when they're speaking, do I feel what they're saying? Do I feel an impact in my being? Is it something entering in? If it's not, then, well, maybe they're just a talking head. Maybe they've rehearsed that. They're a great actor. You know, uh, you know the um, uh, Westworld. Did you watch Westworld series? Oh, no, I didn't. I'm not a great TV watcher. It, it, it's pretty dark, but it's pretty amazing. It's an update on an old movie called Westworld. And it's about, you know, human androids that are so incredibly lifelike. You, you can't tell. You just can't tell the difference. And so that's. That's what Persona is like. It's very lifelike. It's very sophisticated, very complex. It can have tremendous, uh, uh, sophisticated concepts, ideas, language, and so on. But it's just a machine running. Just a machine running. So in the homeopathy, eventually we want to treat the person's essence. The trauma is really in the essence. It's not in the persona. Persona is not, it's, it's a non-entity. It doesn't really, exist. it's just mechanism. It's bio, it's, clever biological mechanism it's a car it's a toaster you know? it's a computer very complex so, computer so in homeopathy so, uh, we have to be able to have an insight into the essence of the person who the person really is and that can be very different than the uh persona and also it can be very developmentally arrested right it may be a small child it, it may not have gone past puberty. We know there's a lot of <laughs> a, women are complaining all the time that men are very adolescent. Many, many men have not made it through their puberty. puberty. They're very adolescent, it really in, true in the core of them. They may be very sophisticated, very successful in business, something like that. But if you strip that away and usually it gets stripped away like in a crisis, right? Then you still find out, we always know in a crisis, you find out what a person's really like. Suddenly, where did this selfish horrible person come or where did this scared little person come from that is the real that is the child that is living in them it's a terrifying concept isn't it but so, uh, actually, a lot of people that seek out homeopaths live in their essence i've never even thought that before but now i do get that now i've always said in in homeopathy we're very lucky because our patients self-select it's not like you know any joe or jane go well, i'll go to the doctor look up one in the phone book no People only come to me be from another person. I, I get about 0.1% of people, you know, they found my name somewhere. 
but they heard from someone else. So uh, plus energetically, there's no question you attract patients energetically based on some uh, resonance, some, some compatibility. So um, we do get a lot of patients as homeopaths. We get patients that are have an open mind. They've, they've actually chosen the kind of system. They've probably done some research. They're thinking people and they're usually essence people and they're conflicted people as we should be, you know, conflicted in the sense of I'm trying to change. I see things that need to change. I'm struggling. And that's what a nor that's what a healthy, normal person should be doing. You're always struggling to uh, become a, that much better and to achieve your potential. So, yeah, I mean, that's the highest, that's one of the homeopathic things, isn't it? Trying to help people achieve their ultimate self. Yeah. Um, so in your view, I mean, I hear what you're saying about a lot of people coming to us who are in their essence. But um, do you think that we have to get through some of that persona first? And how do we get there? How do we, as a homeopath, how do I then delve into somebody's essence? How do I try and strip away that persona to get into their essence? Read my books. Uh, I think what the, see a, lo a lot of things do help promote essence and they help us see essence, but we just don't have the language. This is so, so important. I, don't, I, I can't emphasize this enough. If you don't have the language for what a thing is, you'll miss it. You know, you can have an experience and go, oh, that was cool. I have no idea what that was, but that was cool. So it, now where is it? It's gone. But if you say, ah, I, here's what it is. And then I'll recognize it next time and next time and next time. Now you build up in it. You know, so language is very important and, and being able to identify on a intellectual, you could say rational, but it's actually not really intellectual because words have meaning. It's if you understand the meaning of that experience, and then have a word for that meaning, which is just signifies it or gets you there, then that's very important. So already understanding that you're looking, you're trying to, there was one homeopath who gave a lecture in um, in England a number of years ago. He was head of the Welsh homeopath, Welsh homeopathic society. I forget his name, but I do remember that, he, you know, this is the stage and there was probably 500 people there and he took off his shoes and it is to give his lecture in bare feet, quite a fun guy forget his name but maybe he'll show up on the call um but he said it's like waiting for the shutters of a of a camera to open and you might just get that momentary shutter where you see the real person and then you're back in he just he was describing persona in essence he didn't know it he didn't, didn't have the words but uh usually there is that shield that that uh People are present themselves as persona because they want to be liked. They want to be accepted. They think that they would be afraid to, and they think nobody wants to see the real person. So I think our compassionate, compassionate uh, regard, our uh, uncompromisingly uh, open and uh, um, accepting regard is a big part of it. I mean, that's how, why do people talk to us? Because they trust you. <laughs> right they trust you because they see that you truly are present for them you're interested you care etc so that's a big part of it um but still if we have the language and we know that there's a lot of nonsense is going to be going on we don't want to repertorize that you don't want to start putting all those symptoms together you want to get to the core uh sometimes i mean there's a lot involved and there's a lot of techniques involved one technique that I use sometimes uh, is, I guess you could call it shock therapy. What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? So I'm not asking you that, but people are going along, especially when they're going blah, 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 and they're going, they're, they're giving you a narrative. You can see they're, they're just telling a story. You know, it's like somebody who's um, guilty of a crime and they're, they're telling you some story to throw you off. They really are because they don't want you to, they don't want to disclose that crime. What's the worst thing that's happened? Oh, well, that. And then they'll tell you something that had nothing to, where the hell did that come from? We, we've been talking for an hour. You didn't even mention, I remember one patient who, as they were walk, uh, the last thing, I think they were walking out the door and they said something about, oh yeah, I haven't felt that way since my twin sister died. Your, your twin sister? What? You didn't tell me anything about this twin sister who you were so close to your whole life. You felt there was this one mind your whole life and then suddenly they were gone. You didn't say anything about that. Uh 
So that question can bring people to their essence, bring people to uh, disclose something deeper. Um, but, but generally, uh, I find for, for myself, back in the early days, I was always worried because it's like, I got an hour, I got an hour and a half, I got to figure out the remedy by an hour and a half. And at some point, I relaxed and went, the remedy comes, I know the remedy comes. So now I, I could care less. I just want to be there with the person, the remedy will show up in the room. Eventually, I know that within an hour, and if it doesn't, I'll go, okay, I'm going to do some work. But I, I'm very confident that sometimes in five minutes, the remedy will show up, just leave it alone. What I want to do is have a rapport uh, that can allow that person to disclose what's really bugging them. And, you know, the homeopathic in, in my, I even opened this, this, this place here. You know, the, this yeah, totality of symptoms. This great chart that I drew. drew. Yeah, it's a great chart. Cool. <laughs> Thirteen kinds of uh, of ways of finding the remedy, but um, just taking time and making space for that person. Um, I, I'm, you know, I generally have confidence that's going to something's going to arise. And uh, again, it's a priority. What what is it that need that? is the pressing urgency that will change things around. And so I, I have much less reliance on the traditional modalities. I, I repertorize, but just to show me a list, not to find the remedy, but to show me a list of possibilities that I hadn't thought of. Oh yeah, I didn't think of that one. And then, yeah, I might lead the witness or I might look for that because, oh yeah, I didn't, didn't get that there might be a lot of resentment there. So uh, go in that direction. Uh, but yeah, if we're just treating the physical illness, then then the modalities and, and the location and all that is very, very important. But otherwise, just uh, allowing the information to come forth, uh, if you know your remedies. Uh, and oh, as I said, with with the time constraint, um, generally just allowing, allowing, that's it, that's the word, just allowing, then that will arise in, in its various dimensions. But there still is the idea of, uh, a lot of dribble that you have to just uh, discard and or things that are leading you astray and so on. So yeah, it's, 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 I, I love that journey. I love that journey of getting to know a person in, in a deeper way and um, getting to understand them. They feel better about it and I feel better about it too. If, and uh, oh yeah, I was going to say, that's what I was looking for that. It's very much like the process of um, when they're doing a film promotion or not even if it's a film promotion, but you see some little, clip from a movie. Now we're going to show you a clip from the movie. And you have a clip here and a clip there. And again, what the heck is the plot? You can't tell the plot. So in homeopathy, we're getting these little clips and we have to somehow put it together, not in just the plot, but in what they call the, um, what's it called? The treatment or the uh, something like that, where, you know, if I was going to pitch a pitch, if I was going to pitch a show to you, I'd say, okay, this is kind of like Star Wars but done as a cowboy movie where the guy is looking for the girl, but really he's trying to find the trap. You know, there, there's one little sentence that, that summarizes what that thing is about. So that's what I'm looking for in the person. It's just a simple sentence of what it's all really about, what your physical symptoms are about, what your mental symptoms are about. What is that storyline or narrative that ties it all together? So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring all of that disparate information together and make it into one simple, understandable uh, phrase or sentence. And actually, when we express that to the person, not, not in too blunt a way, but that's already a relief for them, that, that they, not only that they know that you understand, but in themselves, they, now they have a framework around which they can understand that, oh, I've been, I've been dealing with that all these years. I've been having that like the woman with the feet, you know, but the, oh, so I'm, I'm not grounded. I'm, my feet are not on the ground. I can't, you know, I can't be present uh, in this world. I didn't quite, I have an incarnational problem, which does happen, you know. Uh, how many people have said that? Uh, what I always say to my, to people is I've been framed. I'm not supposed to be on this planet. I, I'm, I'm supposed to be on the good planet. You know, nothing bad happens over there. Uh, I somehow, you know, they got the wrong guy. So, so many people have said to me that I, I don't belong in this world, right? They, they don't, their internal, their internal goodness, their internal integrity does not match this world. Like, what am I doing? My mother was, hell, she, she, she was such an idealist, you know, looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. She suffered so much and 
thank goodness she's not around to see this world. But even back then in the, you know, the 60s, 70s, she suffered so much from man's inequity towards men. You know, how can people do, how can people be cruel? Mom, they're not like you, you know, kind of thing. So it's uh, it's not an easy place. You know, anyone who says that life is easy, I don't know. They, they're they either living in a bubble or they haven't been here very long. It's a very, very difficult, very challenging place for, for everyone. And, I must uh, admit, I, um, I, I'm with you with the fact that when people come and talk to us as homeopaths, they are somehow coming back to themselves because yeah. they're sharing a story with you that maybe they've never shared with anybody else before. And yeah. you're able to help piece it all together with them. And then that in itself, they walk away from that first consultation already a little bit mended, even before you give them a remedy. So yeah, it's a powerful tool, very powerful. The What, what separates a great homeopath from an average homeopath, which is still pretty damn good, um, is you really have, and I think it happens over time anyway, I don't care who it is, that you've really developed your intuition. So coming up with a remedy intellectually is quite different than having an aha, right? That's what we really want is the aha. Okay, I see that remedy within you. I can already feel how that even thinking of that remedy in you, it, it's already, and people often say that, I feel different. Yeah, because you already, hearing the name of the remedy, you're already getting some resonance. You're already getting some shift and change. So uh, coming to trust your intuitive, we all have it. It's not like some are born without intuition. So in coming to trust your uh, even wisdom mind, I would call your intuition, but your wisdom, your deeper wisdom uh, is uh, so so good for the patient. And it feels so good for you because you don't have doubt. You have you have certainty about it. Now we still don't know exactly how it's going to work with that person. People's lives are complex, and you know things get in the way. But you know that that remedy is a very lovely remedy for them. And then you know you can let it let it happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm conscious of time. I could chat to you for hours and hours. Yeah. But I know we've been here for quite some time. Are there any last thoughts that you want to share with our listeners? Last thoughts. I had made I made a list before, but of course, that's anything else. I'm We've gone about. all over the place. It's been mm. a fascinating conversation. Or even just to tell us, you know, how close are you to, um, I mean, we're only in March now. You think your books are going to be out this year? Oh, yeah, they're, they're going to be. The only thing that's stopping me that's been stopping me for a long time is called money. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, the, the demands of life, then the demands of time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in the... Uh, I always say you can be, be independently rich or independently poor. So I'm, I'm in the independently poor uh, realm of things, I'm still independent. But um, that just depends on how much time I can cobble out from things which I have to do to, to keep surviving and look after the people I need to. So, um, yeah, that's it. But they'll, they'll be coming. Yeah, sure. I look forward also, to those. Perfectionism yeah. is in my way, but <laughs> we're dealing with that. But, well, yeah, I would say the, the – um, uh, what was that last thing I was saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we shouldn't, even though, you know, homeopaths are the, um, since I'm Jewish, I could say that, right? Homeopaths are the Jews of <laughs> of medicine or something like that. I don't know what, what phrase I'd use, but we you know we're the, we're the underdogs. We're the uh, underbelly. But I think uh, all alter alternative practitioners always have to fight against the fact that they are not in the higher status level of society. And that's a choice that homeopaths and other natural practitioners, uh, alternative practitioners make, and they suffer from it. You know, you suffer mightily. I remember one of my students uh, back when I was teaching homeopathy in one of the colleges here in Los Angeles, uh, she was an MD. And the moment she opened her doors, she was booked six months ahead uh, because she was an MD in right in Beverly Hills and uh, practicing natural medicine. And there I am in Santa Monica, struggling to get some more patients, et cetera, et cetera. So you do pay a big price for making some of these decisions. And, uh, but you should take heart that what we are doing will never be, can never be validated by uh, contemporary medicine or the concepts in contemporary. If modern medicine or, or modern science changes completely and becomes physics-based and so on instead of, uh, limited in their understanding of energy, uh, but generally, don't don't hold your breath. 
don't wait for science cannot validate what we're doing and it doesn't need to it's it's a whole different um uh paradigm so we're validated by our own paradigm which stretches back many thousands of years and uh practitioners should take heart and student and uh students of homeopathy and patients of homeopathy should take heart that you're you're involved with something very beautiful very meaningful and uh very gratifying ultimately and it's benefit to all of us yeah i agree with that thank I mean, you for the opportunity to, to oh chat. you're more than welcome it's been fascinating chatting to you thank you so much and we really look forward to um seeing your new books as i say yeah. both lisa and i are fans of the ones that you've put out already on homeopathy yeah. at least i'm gonna um, put but... out uh, i'm gonna put out the 10 laws of power 10 laws of loss 10 laws of shadow and then of course the five ways of power the five elemental psychology and then a book probably called you true and false but i might change the title of that one but yeah those three pillars of of uh elemental psychology because wow. power loss and shadow make the world go round that's how it works most of the world is in loss and shadow we want to get back to our power so uh, hopefully we can both help them do that <laughs> hopefully hopefully well Asa, i really appreciate you taking the time to spend with me yeah. today so uh, thanks very much